And we are live. Thank you for joining me. We are here with Dodge Landisman and Mandy McGee. Thank you guys Hi. for joining me today. No problem. Mandy, nice to meet you as well. You I too. Talk, talk to Jacob for a second, but uh, Heck Mandy, yeah. So thank you. Thank you for awesome. arranging. It. Yeah. No, I wanted to arrange this with you guys because you um, both are journalist you more so uh experienced than jacob he's getting into it and i just love doing advocacy work i'm not really a journalist but i like you know getting deep with people having nice conversations about yeah. what is wrong in our country what's and how to help children and abusive situations all that that's my bag heck yeah well, I'm thinking what would be maybe a good way to kind of get things started since we're going to all three of our channels here. So there are probably some viewers who might not know who one or more of us is, is go ahead and start with introductions. So since I'm talking, I can go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jacob Harkey. I use he, him pronouns. I am located south of Los Angeles. And over the last couple of years, I've been paying lots of attention to uh, abuses and allegations uh, surrounding the Church of Scientology. And over the last few months, I've gotten much more into protesting Scientology locations or Scientology adjacent businesses. And I'm still I'm still kind of getting into getting the hang of what exactly the future looks like for me as a as an aspiring journalist and as an activist. But I'm super stoked to be talking with you guys here today and I'm super stoked to get into some more chats about the topics that we're all interested in. Awesome. Likewise. Well, I'm Mandy McGee and um, I am a preschool teacher first and foremost and Whoa. I've had a really traumatic childhood which led me to my advocacy work. I'm also disabled so I do a lot of advocacy work in, with disabled abilities. Um, and when I'm looking into like these cults and stuff, I want to know how they treat their disabled people as well as, you know, uncovering all the abuses and stuff that go on behind the scenes. Respect. Like, yeah. Always important. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, I was part of the 504 Democratic Club for a while, which was a big okay. disability advocacy organization. I have a learning disability. Uh, so definitely, definitely respect what you did. I went to special ed school for a while. Um, so yeah, respect all your efforts. I guess I'm Dodge Landisman, uh, also a journalist. I must say with Jacob, I think he's already a real journalist, uh, because I really, I followed him when he was covering the Masterson trial and I messed up on the with or without prejudice, which was like my Achilles oh, yeah. heel. Jacob did not. So he knew his legal, so I don't know. <laughs> in some ways, I think he's more of a, a journalist than I am, but, uh, we both have our hearts in the right place. Uh, that's what counts. And, um, as people probably know, and I'm sure we'll get into this, uh, with a longer conversation, but I used to be a local TV news anchor based out in Yuma, Arizona. And after the death of Lisa Marie Presley, uh, I noticed that none of the media knew that she was, she could have very well testified in the retrial of Nanny Masterson. She was on the original list and had they assembled their, their second list when she was still alive, she may have very well been on it. So I just want to add that. And then Corinne Powell, who is the uh, spokesperson, international spokesperson for the church of Scientology called me, take it down. I did not, uh, and church threatened to sue the station unless they fired me. And then I went on with all these anti-YouTube people, I mean, anti-Scientology YouTube people. And now I'm sort of traveling the country, uh, was focusing on the primaries out in New Hampshire and South Carolina, going to do some border stuff and then go out to LA. If there's any, if there's anything left, and we'll talk about this, I guess, if there's anything left of the Leah Remini lawsuit. Uh, so I'm hoping to go out there, but well, I guess we'll have a conversation and, and get the details on that. But yeah, excited to be a fan of both of you guys and Manny have subscribed to you and uh, oh, Jacob. Thanks. You. Yeah, of course. So uh, I haven't done very much <laughs> on here. I <laughs> yeah, mostly have just been together. Yeah, just most mostly have um, been modding for Laura FM and for Liz Ferris, right. and then I yes. and then Jacob Harkey as well, getting his channel started. Mm -hmm. um, I came onto the YouTube scene like over 10 years ago. So awesome. I haven't really done a live since 2013 because I used oh, wow. to do a lot of lives just talking to local artists. Um, I'm honored. Um, yeah. I just I love talking about art. <laughs> if you if cool. you didn't see, I had a little chat with Liz Ferris and um, uh, what's his name? One of the mustards. Is it Jamie or 
Daniel Mustard. We talk gotcha. about music and like gotcha. the okay. therapy of music and how nice music can like be and peaceful it can be. It was a really nice conversation. Right on. I love to hear that. And Dodge, I did want to say thank you for your compliments about uh, journalism. Yeah. It's definitely, it's actually something that I've had conversations about on my channel before of like towing the line between being an activist and being a journalist and wanting to yeah. be factual and discuss situations while re reporting the facts, but also indicating where I stand. And I've, it's something that I've, it's something that I've sort of gone back and forth in my own head about, about which term is more appropriate for me to call myself, or can I say that I'm an activist right. and a journalist? And it's actually something that I'd be curious to hear your input about if it's, uh, if you have any, yeah. if you have any. I thought, on yeah. Here. I, you know, I thought a lot about that and I, I thought about what, what you would fit into. And it was interesting because when I was applying to graduate schools, uh, for masters, one of the, uh, programs that you could apply to. Most of them were just normal. And I ended up be, uh, going to Emerson, which is a normal journalism master's program. But CUNY, the City University of New York, had a social journalism program. What that meant is that you are trained to be an activist journalism. You know, it's funny, journalism doesn't necessarily have to be objective. If you're working for an objective source, uh, then of course you have to be objective. And of course, you if you're a journalist, the truth is always objective. So that's you know, that, that you can't get around that. But if you're a journalist who feels that some sort of organization, corporation, bigger power structure needs to be exposed, and you have a personal interest in that, and you might even have a bias against them, well, that's that's social journalism. So that would be activism coupled with journalism. And I, mm -hmm. I would say I'm on, the, on, on a very similar uh, uh, plane as you in that regard, where I say, what, do you, what, do you, what are you? And I'd say, yeah, I'm an activist journalist. So yeah, I, I think <laughs> unless you formally work for the AP or for a TV news station, uh, you could certainly be that. And all you need to do is just kind of be committed to the truth and uh, 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 remark upon each fact that you find out, whether it helps your personal bias or not. You're allowed to bring your bias. The only thing is you can't let, uh, you can't obscure any facts because of your bias. That's that's the simple rule. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I actually really appreciate you sharing the thoughts in that way. That uh, yeah, because Jacob, you and I had a conversation about that recently, didn't we? Like where you we were did, like, yeah. I don't know how to not be biased. Like, how do you like do the balancing act of it? Yeah, yeah. Well, particularly, well, you, you know. But one, just one example, like particularly in the context of Scientology, I can definitely say. Anytime that I'm talking about a legal case that's involving Scientology or whatever it, whatever the story may be, I am coming at it from the perspective of I'm somebody who wants the abuse to stop. I'm somebody who yeah, thinks that exactly. Scientology uh, has abused their tax exempt status and should have their tax exempt status revoked. And I guess typically, maybe some some journalists out there might think that that's not responsible journalism to be saying that as a reporter who's supposed to be right. being objective. But like you were saying, I think that as long as I'm not allowing those preconceived notions I may be coming into a story with to obscure the facts, then right. I do think then I think it's still doable. But yeah, yeah. I think I think it's always a good I, I kind of like to keep the conversation open and continue to get other opinions from folks who are in the activist or in the journalist plane, whichever, whichever one they may tend to lean more toward, if one. Right, exactly. And a journalist is also, in addition to relaying information, a journalist is about being a conversationalist and knowing, and, and Mandy's doing some of this as well, knowing who to connect with whom uh, and, and asking the right type of questions. And that, that doesn't necessarily have to do really with biasness or not. Uh, and so like, in my opinion, like you're, you're a journalist and a story, like I got information from you about the Danny Masterson trial that other people didn't have. Uh, that's new journalism that you brought. Um, but it's interesting because in today's day and age that, yeah, the, 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 the official, you know, Walter Cronkite type archetype of journalist is doesn't almost doesn't exist anymore. Well, you think of some of them and they've all had egg in their face, like Tucker Carlson or Don Lemon, or mm -hmm. people like that. Uh, so what, what does it really mean anymore? Uh, I think ours is maybe even a little more pure than a lot of the mainstream stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's always, always something that I, that I thought about. What do you do? And I say, well, I guess I'm a, a YouTuber journalist. I suppose. <laughs> nice. So Dodge, I'm curious to know, you talked about the fact that when you were at the TV station in Arizona, you, uh, started 
you, well, you talked about the story covering Lisa Marie Presley's death and some of the connection yeah. to Scientology. I'm curious what uh, led you to stumble upon that, or if you had already followed Scientology stories before yes. that, or if that was kind of yeah. Why don't you Why don't you uh, start there and how how you yes, landed on that story? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's bizarre because well, here's here's the one weird thing about TV news. It, oddly enough, in order for you to have a successful career in TV news, you actually have to not like news very much, meaning you have to like being in front of the camera, reading what they give you, not mm -hmm. thinking about it, not thinking. Because what, what happens is like CNN will give you copy and you read the national story from CNN and you copy. You know, you are allowed to change it, but the most successful person in traditional TV news won't have the mind to change it. They'll be like, oh, I'm not analyzed because they, they won't go to YouTube and consume the news in there, which is deeply ironic and tragic. Uh, but I had always been super into Scientology. I'm, I've, I'd always been into cults, uh, quite frankly, ever since I was younger. So I think when, yeah, you know, too. Scientology. Yeah, yeah. It's fascinating, right? Because I, I've always been somebody who's been so individualistic and I've never lived in one place for longer than six months. And I've lived in a lot of, worked in a lot of different environments. So like get going anywhere towards a cult is like a scary thing. Uh, so Scientology always fascinated me. I became aware of it in South Park. Uh, I must have read Mike Ringer's book. I can't remember if that was before or after uh, uh, January of a year ago when I got fired. Uh, but I certainly, I consumed every episode of the aftermath. I was watching Aaron Smith Levin. Uh, so I, I, I knew a healthy amount. I, I would say I consumed 10 minutes of Scientology content a day. So I was like, oh, I uniquely know about this topic in a way that other reporters, even nationwide, doesn't have this unique interest or insight into. Mm -hmm. So I was, I knew about the Lisa Marie Presley thing the whole time. The first thing that popped up in my mind when she passed away and I was looking for it was like, well, isn't anybody going to say that she's kind of badass for, uh, 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 be, you know, for possibly suffering fair game from Scientology and owning up for her mistake and wanting to make things right. And that's kind of a heroic legacy. And again, it's about the bias. I didn't call Lisa Marie Presley heroic, but I thought it was this important facet that you had to add, uh, that she was really willing to risk her livelihood in more ways than one, honestly. Uh, so I just, I saw that copy of CNN, when it happened in the and we could read what national stories you want to do, right? So I could have not, I could have not put anything about Lisa Marie. I could have talked about the the government shutdown again, or, or you know, I think Kevin McCarthy. They're trying to uh, deal with that with that whole speaker. Rest in peace uh, with that I mean, whole. Speaker. Did they tell you that you weren't allowed to talk about Scientology? No, they had no idea. That the weird part is they do had no idea because oh. I I anchored the morning news station. And, and the ratings were going up and people seemed quite like me. So he kind of trusted me. And so there's really no, no oversight. So he never said I could or couldn't. He got mad. I mean, afterwards, of course, he didn't, he said, I don't know where you got that they fair game people from. That seems unfair. You seem to be attacking a religion unless you get, you know, I, I, we were both an NBC and a Fox and a CBS. We were three networks. So he, my boss was like, you didn't get that from the Associated Press, from CBS, from NBC, or from Fox. Therefore, it's not legitimate information, and it's opinion, even though it was an opinion. Uh, so no, he had he had he had no idea. But he used to be cool with me adding stuff, and knew I did. So that that was the weird part. And but most of them, the, the fish were too big to fry anyway. Like I went, uh, I did an article, uh, and read it on the news, and clipped it on YouTube as I clipped the Lisa Marie Presley thing on youtube as well uh about the the saudi arabian government having undue influence in the water control of arizona and uh how the the saudi arabians got one of the uh, lobbyists kind of put on the water board and that got like ten thousand views i didn't get any trouble with that so that was cool but there you know i don't think the saudi arabian government's going to care uh but scientology is just small time enough where they would care what some schmuck in a, a city of a hundred thousand people is doing which seems very bizarre to me uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that's a weird scene. Well, thank you for sharing that. And yeah, one thing that I think might be helpful for uh, folks who are viewing who may have not uh, followed along with the Danny Masterson case and know about the whole Lisa Marie Presley connection, we could give a little bit of context there. So Danny Masterson, I'm sure that most people are probably at least somewhat familiar with the trial, but he was convicted in May of last year on two counts of forcible RAPE. 
to skirt the algorithm. Still not declared. Still, yeah. Still not declared a suppressive person by the Church of Scientology. To the best of our knowledge, he is still a member in good standing, as are his uh, friends and family. Now, his um, what what happened in the trial that was interesting was Jane Doe one on whose count he was convicted. Um, one thing that came up in the courtroom, but while the jury was not present, so it wasn't technically while the uh, it wasn't it, it wasn't part of testimony that the jury heard. But while journalists were in the room, the, uh, p- particularly journalist Tony Ortega heard a conversation between the attorneys and the judge where it was revealed that Lisa Marie Presley uh, had participated in te- convincing Jane Doe one not to report her assault to the police, which means that she was acting as an agent on behalf of the church, participating in obstruction right. of justice. Tell and yeah. yeah, once the prosecutor indicated that he was able to um, get immunity for her so that she wouldn't be incriminating herself and she couldn't be charged on obstruction of justice, uh, she indicated that she was willing to testify and Uh, From what I remember, she did give a taped interview to the prosecution. However, uh, the judge didn't want to bring in the whole obstruction of justice component because she thought that that wasn't uh, or she didn't want to bring up that whole conversation about not going to the police as it was determined that that wasn't relevant enough to the trial during that first trial. So first exactly. So once uh, once that happened, then the prosecution ended up not calling her as a witness at all. Now, between the first trial and the second trial, Scientology came up in very limited ways during the first trial. The judge was uh, somewhat strict about how much Scientology-related content was allowed. And for example, there was no Scientology expert in the first trial. And in the second trial, there was. Claire Headley did know testify. That's fascinating, huh? Mm-hmm. So I'm super curious if there had been... if she had not died between the first and second trial, would they have brought her in as a witness since they were allowing more Scientology related content in? But unfortunately we'll never know. I would love to know about that taped interview though. If you did a taped interview with the prosecution where she revealed that she participated in obstruction of justice, that could be, that could be really interesting if that's still out there. How, how do you get access to stuff like that? Do you do a FOIA request? I wonder, like, I wonder what even, because now I should start thinking about that. That's a fascinating tidbit to think about. You know, I, I would love to know more info too. Yeah, yeah if there's anybody in the legal world out there who has any insight about how we could come across that, that would be, yeah. that really would be fascinating. Boy of stuff. Yeah. yeah I started reason. learning about the legal system more and like how uh, trials go basically because I had, I'd been thrown into one myself. Oh, wow. I was sued by a predator in my Oof. local area, um, along with another friend and um, the girl who he uh, drugged and possibly graped. Oh my god! Uh, and uh, yeah, he like basically kidnapped her from a club. <laughs> with and wow. she woke up with none of her stuff, no cell phone, no purse, no car keys. Her car was still at the club. Um, that kind of stuff. So five years goes past. She's disappeared because when she tried to say something about it, he did everything he could to silence her. She came back and he did not like that she was popping back up in the world and decided to make a really horrible video about me and a bunch of other people oh in, our, in our area about like how she was the one who like pressured him into getting the drugs for her, all that kind of stuff. But anyway, Long story short, um, he dismisses it two weeks before we were supposed to go to trial. And I bet it's because he knew that he was going to be buried. We were yeah. waiting for trial. We weren't trying to right. stop this. We were like, come, we have evidence. We have literal we evidence. He up, so he wanted to be like, legit, oh, I'm ready to go to trial. Here's how yeah. I'm in the right. And then, and then and he hopes everybody forgets about it once, like two months later, like you actually yep. go to trial. Yeah. Yeah, so he wasted everybody's time and money, and it was, you know, my first time dealing with courts, so I didn't know what I was doing, and I, you know, it was very traumatizing, actually, 
Um, and it made one of the girls move out of state because she was afraid that he was going to try and sue us again because he would threaten it constantly. Right. Like every three months, this guy would come back out going, I have more evidence. I'm going to start my new trial again. I'm so sorry, man. <laughs> I didn't know about any of that. But that was back in 2017. And he has largely stopped stalking us from what I can see, thankfully. But well, I admire, of, I admire you using your knowledge to, you know, and, and, and emotions that you had from that to kind of look at the masters and stuff. I mean, that's, yeah. So know. like I took that and then I went to watching Emily D Baker. If you're not familiar with her, she is a fantastic lawyer that gives really good information, good, solid information that someone like me who's autistic can actually process and understand what she's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and I watched the entire uh, defamation case for the Amber Heard Johnny Depp thing because oh, yes. I was like I want to know what an actual defamation case looks like <laughs> and so I've just gone from court case to court case and just since then and nice. obviously the Danny Madison case and um, there's been others like that involve children that I've been uh, watching like the Mormon mom who had the eight passenger oh, yeah. case passing, I yeah, have Ruby been watching Franks. yeah, yeah she's I have been watching Ruby Frankie for Freaking years out. and oh that's really oh so you're actually like legit fan of hers i was not a fan because i fucking hate that's family funny. channels but i was watching her to see the abuses that were happening oh, that's and, interesting and you can um, tell you can tell even before it like blew up that there were like these little kernels mm -hmm. she was abusing her children way before she got involved with that other woman and then when right. she got involved with that other woman i sort of infiltrated their space cool because I wanted to see what they were talking about. And I acted like I was, you know, one of them. Um, and eventually their Facebook got hacked and everybody was booted out. And I didn't know what happened after that. But then we see that what has occurred now. And, and it is way darker than I even thought it was going to get. Interesting. And... and it's so sad because I see abuse cases all the time where kids almost lose their life or they do lose their life. And the pandemic made it 10 times worse. Well, they're trapped. Yeah. Because all those people who were abused were now trapped with their abusers. And so unfortunately, there was a lot of cases I watched where the kids were no longer here from dying in the from the pandemic. I mean, not from the pandemic but you know what i mean um so the next thing that i am looking at um that i want to get more people to uh form opinions with me and like maybe get journalists who might be interested in writing stories is the troubled teen industry yeah um and i, I talked about about it a little bit with you dodge before we came on here and um i almost went to one I was threatened with, yeah, I was threatened with it because, um, just a little backstory. I didn't grow up in a cult, but my religion is kind of a cult. It's the Southern Baptist convention. Oh, aren't they? Yeah. Well, not, 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 uh, supportive of LGBTQ people. I can tell you that much. No, no. Yeah. Um, my or church, yeah, I basically was with my church from the age of three till about 24. And um, my grandmother was quite abusive as well because the church uh, wants you to be abusive to your kids. Basically, you're not a kid. It's just like in Scientology. Like, I mean, Scientology is a little bit more extreme. But in a lot of these cases, especially with religion, you're not really a child. You're like property to your parents. Um, well, you're nothing. It's like you're not worthy, right? It's like you're not worthy until you read more of the Dianetics books until you look at the sea or or with the southern baptist it's not worthy maybe until you go on <laughs> mission to africa you, so to, you know or or not worthy until you know you officially get married and, and claim that you're excited to have 20 children and it's it's a weird mm -hmm. thing it's like you're yeah, you as a child and these cults or these religious cults are, are kind of like if you are a child you are nothing which is a painful way to grow up yeah um especially with like the whole like you're a sinner as soon as you're born and you must right. repent constantly. Right. Like, like, like F you for, for being born. How dare you be born? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks. That's I didn't choose that. I know. Right. right. <laughs> so, I mean, that's how I grew up. And the thing that almost got me 
um, put in one of those places was me and my cousin drank a little bit of wine out of my grandparents' cool. cabinet. And I honestly didn't think there was that much wrong with it because we were an Irish family and I'm used to getting like at special events. I know. I, like I would get a spoonful of, of whiskey or a spoonful of whatever they're drinking. Hey, Mandy, you want to come taste this? And so I was like, well, I knew where all the alcohol was. And we were just were bored one night <laughs> and we were like in eighth grade and we start taking like a little bit of swigs out of these. Then she decides to go home and rat on me. And that's what almost got me sent to one of those places. And how old were you again? I was in eighth grade. Eighth grade. So like 14. 14, yeah. So oh, yeah, 14, yeah. 15, I think is right around the time that a lot of those kids are get are taken out of their homes. To yeah, I, I was sent to 18, weirdly enough. So I was on the, on the end. Oh, the, you were the end. The, the Yeah, you did say that you kind of had a little bit of experience with going into one. Yeah, um, yeah. I did and this what is was... the troubled teen programs that you guys are talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's like a myriad of them, right? So you could do the therapeutic boarding school. Uh, a lot of people, they'll do the therapeutic boarding school or, you know, uh, pray away the gay type camps, which mm -hmm. kind of fit into that same category. Uh, it, I went to wilderness therapy for two months with oftentimes if you spend time in wilderness therapy, uh, you'll transition into a therapeutic boarding school. Luckily, my parent, my parents wanted to send me to one, but then they did some more research and kind of figured out a lot of these guys were being paid off and was like, all right, you got this punishment enough. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been there, done that and spent about, and spent about uh, two months altogether in Colorado, uh, which is not fun. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, sure. I'm starting to feel like none of those types of schools, boarding schools, none of them are good for kids. Honestly, yeah. that is just my opinion full stop. Like, I know that some people, like rich kids, will be sent to some good boarding schools. Maybe they haven't been abused, but yeah. the type of schools that a lot of these people are sent to, you have to be um, a certain type of person, I think, for it to actually work on you. I don't see it working for someone who's autistic or, you know, has other learning well, disabilities. Right. Yeah. Um, because like I think about myself and like how I grew up and like how like I was not I was misdiagnosed I didn't know I was autistic till I was in my late 30s and oh, I'm, wow. 40, I'm 42 now um so I'm been learning over the last like five years about what autism even is fully because I didn't know what it was fully I was told I was ADHD um Sounds and like given, me, and given Sounds Ritalin like you know, it's, it sounds like me where I got tested to be on and I was tested to actually be on the spectrum. And I had like, uh, I was found out to have nonverbal learning disorder, which is like on the spectrum of autism. My parents were so adamant. It was like a shame thing, right? If I was mm -hmm. even vaguely on any sort of Asperger's autistic spectrum, they were like, don't even think about you. That's not what you are. So I still want to get tested actually. So that's yeah. cool. Like, My I'm grandmother like, is still like that about her own son. And I'm like, he has ADHD. He talks to me. He has talked to me about it. And she's like, no, he doesn't. He's There's nothing wrong with any of you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right, right, right. It's 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 brush. It. It's it's the same shit. It's like a part of my friends. It's like brush it onto the rug and create the best appearance that you could create. Whether that's baptism, with you know creating the perfect family. Whether that's any other type of family, saying mm -hmm. oh, are you know we're 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 following the traditional confines of normal and taking pride in our child, following the traditional, irrelevant, outdated confines of what it is to be you know a purely functioning. Uh, positively functioning member of society, which are arcane and outdated and irrelevant. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so you, we, I think we both went through that in a, in a way. You yeah. a little more hardcore than me. My parents were at least pretty progressive at the end of the day. But Oh, uh, yeah. Like my parents cool. were both hippie drug addicts. Oh, all right. Interesting. Um, they're no longer yeah. with me. Okay. I'm sorry uh, to unfortunately. Sorry. I mean, it's fine. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't know what to say to <laughs> Um, yeah, it, I had a very weird life. Like yeah. I, I'm fine with both my parents being gone <clears throat> for the most part, just because of their lives that they love lived were yeah. not great. And so yeah. I don't have to be a parent to them anymore. No, that's, that's the way I kind of look at it Ooh. is like, yeah. I was always the parent to them, even though I didn't live with either of them, I still oh, had them cool. in my life. Um, 
Yeah, I don't want to get too sad here. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. No, I actually appreciate you. I appreciate you sharing everything that you did because actually, I, I've learned some. I've learned some things about you that I didn't previously know, and it gives some yeah. good context for kind of how you're entering into this space and this community. Yeah, of... and you can. You guys can now see like where I'm. My background is and why, why I want to do the advocacy work that I really want to do. Like, yeah, I was. I was alone a lot of the time and even when i wasn't alone i was lonely yeah. and i just felt like no adult even my teachers weren't really there for me and so that's why i became a teacher like i've always wanted to be at least that one adult that they could you yeah. know trust um and come to if they don't have anybody else um because i know how lonely childhood can get especially if you're in um kind of a neglectful or abusive household um yeah, so my one of my experiences, I can actually uh, can see the parallels between how they work these troubled teen and um, schools and uh, mental hospitals. Oh, interesting. Ooh. So I went to one when I was like 16, 17, and it's pretty traumatic. I felt like, how am I supposed to be in a place that's supposed to help me, but I'm feeling more traumatized than I did before I came here. Because one, they tricked me going in. They made me feel like it was my idea when it really wasn't. I was a minor. Um, two, um, you're put on 24-hour suicide watch when you first get in there. And they put me in a tiny cement room with a mattress and no blankets um, right next to the nurse's station. And the lights were on the whole time. And then the door was locked. Yes, right? But I'm but supposed to be there to because I am suicidal, but this is right. what they're doing to you. Right. Um, one of the things that I didn't like in our group sessions was the uh, talk of too many details. Right. Because you have a group of minors sitting around talking about their molestation details. Oh, gosh. That, it's I was free. the oldest one there, and I'm sitting here listening to a 12-year-old talk about him getting you know, molested by his uncle. And I'm like, I feel weird listening to these details. Like, sure. why are, why? <laughs> and then you just like, I started learning, like you have to kind of play a game in order to get yourself out of there. Out of two weeks, I went outside for five minutes in a tiny ass courtyard with eight foot tall fences. It's jail. Shit's worse than jail. Yeah. So and sorry. I and then when you're outpatient, you're basically there all day long, except for you get to go home and sleep. Um, and then the same stuff happens. The only things I really actually took from there that helped me was art therapy. Mm -hmm. I actually That's enjoyed cool. art therapy. Yeah. And I actually have taken some of like what I've learned. I work it on myself. I work it with the kids that I work with. It's not like I'm trying to therapize the kids I work with. Um, right. But some of the techniques that you can use in art therapy, you can use with anybody. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I will say, Manny, I just want to say like respect for like turning your pain into productivity and first having the independence to go outside the environment that you were in where people constantly try to tell you how wrong you were, where you weren't really being wrong at all for any reason. Uh, and, you know, it's with the Scientology stuff too, man. It's like, I respect people who break out of it because they're so wrapped up in this culture that repeats the same things over and over for them to be fiercely independent out of thin air and say, no, I'm not into this. I'm not into this at all. I'm going to help people. I'm going to fight against this when there's no, you know, you don't have access to the information the way that other people have, or you can't look at it in the way that other people have. Uh, and for you just to be like, I'm going to understand my pain. I'm going to uh, understand it verbally and I'm going to use that to be there for the current people that are in pain is, is super cool. Also, I want to give a shout out to Thanks. selfless self for uh, yeah. watching. Uh, I got I got to interview you at some point, by the way, dude. So yeah, he's been you. cool. I like him. <laughs> Heck yeah. I do see that selfless self is in here. That's awesome to see. Good to see you in yeah. here. Thank you for joining. Yeah. Yeah. Subscribe to his oh. channel. He's a, he's a good channel. Yeah. Heck also, yeah. the other th the other thing I forgot to mention about mental hospitals. I don't know if they do it in everyone, but punishments. You're there for therapy, yet there's so many rules, 
if you break any of them, you do what is called worksheets. And when I was watching the program on Netflix, uh, that was one of the things that they did. And I was like, oh, my God, I just got thrown back into that hallway, just sitting there all day long writing about my feelings, all because my grandmother and I were having a phone call and I only got one phone call, period, for almost the whole time I was there. And she didn't want to let me go. And I said, hey, the nurse is telling me I have to go. I have to go. Okay, grandma, I have to go. I have to go. And I finally hang up the phone and they were like, well, you went over your time. So then I got punished. Like, I, was always looking I for don't, time. yeah, I don't understand why these fair, I, I stay, I almost want to stay away from anything that says a therapeutic place. Cause I'm like, are you really? <laughs> well, right. Replace, replace therapeutic with brainwashing. Yes. You know? and, and, and that's what it is. And I remember like, it was weird. Like when I was in wilderness therapy, so the reason that I went is par- like I partially deserved it and partially didn't. My mom would send me these checks of like $175 to cash in as like a weekly allowance. So I'd forge another check midweek and like get another 175. So that was the big issue. But then the other weird part was when I was 18, I was running for city council and uh, in New York city. Yeah. Thank you. And wow. I got some fun. I appreciate that. Yeah. Was, uh, and I, I ran because I used to be a special education student with a learning disability, will still have a learning disability. So I wanted to advocate uh, to make that process to get your kid into a special ed school much easier than it currently is uh, at the moment. So I ran and I had a, a fan of mine who was this old man, uh, uh, obviously gay, who had a, this big handlebar mustache. He's about 78 years old and he had the biggest crush on me. And I felt bad. I, I personally like women have only liked uh, that scene. But I felt bad. I had no prejudice or anything. And I thought my mom did a little bit because she, yeah, the, she said we had to stop hanging out, even though he's perfectly, he never tried to do anything. Uh, again, I could tell he was into me kind of, but again, I felt bad for this old dude. And, you know, we get lunch once a week and it makes him happy and he's a nice guy, whatever. And, you know, if he ever tried to do anything, even at 18, I'd be physically capable of certainly fending anything off, not what she ever tried. But yeah, we said we'd stop hanging out and then we did and mom found out and that was like the last straw. So you wonder, and then I got sent with wilderness therapy where like, it was weird, similar stuff like this. Like, a, you know, a, a, a senior was caught smoking pot outside of uh, uh, a gas station and, you know, his parents wanted like one little joint. And it's just like, yeah, it's like, how, who are you to say what is wrong? And some things are certainly blatantly wrong, but it's fascinating because mm-hmm. everybody's kind of put in the same boat. And then one young man that's a little tougher was uh, uh, addicted to heroin uh, and stole and committed an armed robbery. So it's fascinating that we're, we were all kind of there in the, in the same neck of the woods. And I remember with, with one of the weird things with me is they put you on solo. So you'd say you're outside the entire time when you're in wilderness. Uh, and they put you on solos where you don't have any interaction with people for three days and it almost like makes you crazy. Uh, and then, and lastly, the worst, the worst was you had to dig a latrine. So you had to dig your own toilet. And I didn't know that you were supposed oh. to sit, not sit. So that was quite a disaster. Um, this is a little, a little funny aside, but it was, uh, although I will say we talk about the positives, it helped me appreciate nature because I was like, man, these are great to hike, but they'd forcibly make us hike like eight miles a day with these massive 30 pound backpacks, but I didn't like nature before then. So I was like, boy, God, if I could do this hike, but make it four miles and go to Outback Steakhouse at the end of the night and take a bath at a motel, that sounds really fun. Uh, and then since then I've traveled to 48 states, uh, and 27 in Mexico and six provinces, Canada, essentially just hiking everywhere. So yeah, you're right. They all, all these things at least do kind of bring one, one good facet, one good thing that you kind of take with you um, amidst the bad of which there is more of obviously. How did, how did your parents were, how were they able to send you if you were already 18? I, you know, I essentially, I was on their dime, right? So I could have legally not done it and ran, but right. So if you leave again, it's, it's like, it's the same thing. The same thing with, with the, with the center in Hemet, California, right. You could, you, you could sort of leave, but then you're in the middle of the highway and yeah. you're going to have to walk seven hours to get to a bus station or a public phone. It was the yeah, same thing, right? That's, like you, that's why a lot of these schools, especially the wilderness schools are on the middle of nowhere because they, right. they can't run anywhere. You Right. You say you legally can run, but you, you can't because you have no resources. And part of what should be part of addressing civil liberties is looking at 
okay, is our center near a resource or can we drive this kid? Can we drive this kid either to a shelter, to a Greyhound bus station, to a public library with a computer, with internet access, whatever it is. They don't do that. They just say, okay, we're in the middle of nowhere. If you want to walk 12 miles to the nearest bus station that probably isn't even open, go for it. And that's, that's entrapment. So I, but I, in the very beginning, yeah. what they did is like, it was interesting. It's like at 6 a.m., a dude uh, came in and I thought he was like, they're like, this Dodge, this is Keith. And I thought he's cleaning the windows or something. And then he was this big dude who was there to, and I willingly went, I guess, but he wouldn't tell me where I was going. Until, he never told me on the plane ride the whole time. He said, it's a program. I assumed at least I'd be inside or something. And then I'm like, in the middle of it, like, I bet it's wilderness therapy. And then the moment he leaves and transfer me to the dude in the car to drive me, uh, I had to fly to Denver. And then we flew from Denver. Um, I'm forgetting the Golden, not Golden, Colorado, but there was another, a smaller city near the Four Corners in Colorado. Uh, and then it wasn't until like the moment the dude picked me up where I realized that I was going to wilderness therapy. Uh, so also lack of information and lack of honesty and lack of truth. So I'm, I'm glad you're like, you're talking about this because mm -hmm. this, like this stuff shouldn't be forgotten, honestly. Yeah. And uh, the first time I really, like, I always knew that these places were bad. I've heard stories over my lifetime, sure. but I didn't really understand how bad they really were until I started one. I started with the Indian boarding schools, looking at them. Oh, yeah. Right. That right. Was right. Insane. Culture watching. Same kind of same thing. Yeah, and and then I watched uh, the Paris Hilton documentary because she was at one of those, right. and she's been trying to protest Provo Cannon because the school that they talk about in the program, Ivy Ridge, which is in New York, okay, it is so. connected to a group called WASP, and so it's like it acts like a McDonald's or a franchise or whatever. So there's a main person who Wasp? owns like Wasp. white Anglo Saxon Protestant. <laughs> Those are those, that's technically my culture. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Um, so this company like will make all these other schools and they don't look like they're connected to each other. They're all named something different. And so the Provo Canyon school in Utah was one of the WASP schools that was really, really bad. So the one thing that I learned in the program is how far back this stuff kind of goes. And a lot of it was taken from this uh, group that started in like Venice, California, or around there, or Santa Monica, or something uh, called Senanon. Have you heard of Senanon? No, started in I the fifties. So, <laughs> so when so here's a, one of the big things that they the, the one woman who went to Ivy Ridge that is doing all the journalism for uncovering everything was. Someone said, follow the money. And that is a good idea. You you start following the money, the trail of money, and whose hands it goes in, you find the top person. You find whoever is doing all of this. And um, so they said that a lot of the techniques, it's all about brainwashing and mind control. And it comes from this place called Senanon, where in the 50s, this guy took what they were doing in AA and applied those principles and then turned it up tenfold and applied it to basically experiment on humans. And he was getting drug addicts and all this stuff. Like, um, it, it's kind of crazy. Like, the one thing that absolutely blows my mind is the these things that they call seminars. Basically, you have to berate each other like you get sick yeah, and they're right. doing this to minors so the synonym was all with adults but they're doing all this stuff with minors as well where you sit in a circle and then you listen to all your peers like tear you down and what you right. should do better what you can do better and all this stuff and like it's, it's just a great in there yeah and it's like it's <laughs> it's hurt. stuff that like to basically make you disassociate and become a robot. Right. And it just like, it's insane. <laughs> I don't understand like why, why people are okay with doing this to children or doing it to anybody just for money. Right. And the program is only three parts, but it shows how 
deep and intertwined these places are with our government, with foster care, with DSHS. Like DSHS is helping parents pay to put their kids in these places. Isn't that scary thought? Right. And what is DS DSHS? Sorry. I'm not sure uh, if, I, if I'm familiar. Is that a department, department of, of human oh, services? Okay. It's where you gotcha. go for like, you know, EB, your, your food stamps for, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, whatever you need. It's for low income people. Yeah. For people gotcha. who need help. So like when you have these, these agencies that you're going to for help and they're like oh yeah you only have to pay two hundred dollars and we'll kidnap your kid and send them across state lines and it'll be all good and then there are people who are getting money for sending these kids there so right. people are getting commissions off of the backs of minors and right. also conning parents i'm sure most of these parents a lot of these parents are probably abusive assholes that don't want to like do anything with their kids yeah, and actually be a parent yeah. But some of them are really getting duped. They were like, I don't know what to do with my kid. And like, they're being sent these brochures that make it look like it's like the best therapeutic place for your child. Yeah. They have yeah. all this land to roam around on and they don't know what goes on behind closed doors. God. Until right. years and years later when these kids get out. And here's and another they, they thing. They won't like believe their kid either. They'll be like, oh, the kid's just yeah. not respecting authority. Or like yeah, a lot of them don't believe their kids. And that's why a lot of these kids have had to like go and like research this stuff themselves and show the proof. Like, I'm not lying. Look at this. This is all the right. proof. Um, and what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, yeah. So I don't know. I'm going to. Um, obviously, I don't think every school is is unaccredited. And some people probably did get to graduate. But I'm finding out that these diplomas mean nothing. So these like kids, they're not real high school diplomas. They're not real diplomas. That's so a scary thought. Know really? Or is it, are they not like they're not an accredited? No. That's a scary. So what would you still have to get like your GED if you finish the whole yep. kid caboodle? Yep. That's actually wow. really interesting. So a lot of these kids yeah, wow. are not, a lot of these kids don't find out until they go to apply for college and they're like, oh, this isn't a real degree. That's fat. I know I do. God. Wow, that's tragic. Yeah. So they're not only ruining thousands of kids' like the lives. University of, of high school. They're just literally <laughs> ruining their lives by not letting allowing them to have a future. Yeah, right. Gosh. It just, yeah, it's, it, it's insane yeah. to me. And now this is like, I'm still on like the Scientology train because I really want to see Scientology go down in my lifetime, hopefully. Yeah. But there's like, you can see how there's just so much shit and abusive shit out there that it's, it makes me want to cry, actually. I don't know about you, but it makes me want to cry because I'm like, yeah. uh, I can't, I cannot like fix and help everybody. And there's too much suffering. No, we want to take care of people. Yeah. Um, totally. Just, and the more you learn about one of these abusive power structures, the more you mm -hmm. realize how deep how deep the similar patterns run in all different kinds yeah. of circles. And like it's all connected with the cults as well, because even in the program, they mention Scientology and they mention Nexium and how oh, they use, really? use the same tactics and stuff right. like that of mind control and brainwashing. I mean, I'm pretty sure all cults are pretty much brainwashing you, right? I don't know yeah, any cult yeah. that isn't. <laughs> totally. And Nexium um, definitely took a chip off L. Ron Hubbard's shoulder. They, he was. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. Keith Rainier. I was definitely looking over, looking into L. Ron Hubbard's notes when devising a lot of a lot of his programs. I mean, he even uses the word suppressive in the exact same context. Does he? That's fast. I, wow. You know, I I heard it once or twice. And right, he does. Yeah. That's his term for the enemies of the organization. Right. Yeah. Uh, cut from the same cloth. <laughs> yeah, and a along with the like, just have feeling helpless about a lot of this these issues is just the amount of like cult documentaries that are out there mm -hmm. um, that I see, and I'm just what? like, oh, there's another one that I haven't heard about. Like, yeah, I don't right. even know how many cults all... there are off of Mormonism. There's a oh yeah, there's a lot of documentaries about that. They, you know, well, yeah, Warren Jeffs and everything. And Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Warren Jeffs yeah. is a little bit different only because he made them wear out certain outfits. So you know who yes. those people are. But most of the other ones, they're told, don't say that you're a Mormon. Don't say you're a polygamist. 
say you're just Christian and you're supposed right. to blend in with everybody. Right. That's the most insidious. And also a lot of these cults, especially polygamy cults, will go to Mexico to operate because it's not yes. illegal there. To have Wait, what's not partners. illegal? Oh, multiple to have got partners. it. Yeah. Got multiple it. Wives. Got it. So oh, because there's such a lax of regulations in general, a lot of cults will operate out of Mexico freely. Well, Mitt Romney's dad was born in Chihuahua, Mexico, for in the LeBaron clan. Uh, George mm. Romney later became the governor of, of Michigan, ran for president in 68. But he, yeah, he came from the LeBaron clan, which was an offshoot of the mainstream Church of Latter-day Saints. Uh, and yeah, they're a giant, and this same thing, they're not supposed to say anything to anybody. But they're this, this giant closed off compound where, yeah, I mean, it's not as evil as FLDS. I think they at least wait, isn't that great? At least wait for their bride to be 18. Uh, you know, such a such an accomplishment. Uh, so they're a little better. But yeah, they're huge. I think they're like, I think they have like 4,000 people, something crazy. And, you know, each man has like four or five wives or something like that. Gosh, I did not know. I knew that Mitt Romney was Mormon, but I don't think I real. I didn't realize any of that connection with his father well, and the family that he was born too, into. Yeah. That's I will I'm have actually, to look more uh, into that. That's interesting. Yeah, guys, yeah. If, if you want to subscribe, I'm going to be visiting there in probably about like a month and change. Um, oh yeah, so like, I will definitely be sure to check that out. And that's yeah. that's going to be in Mexico, the place that you're visiting. Yeah. Or yeah. The, okay. I've, I've, gone, yeah. I've gone to 27 states in Mexico. So I know the country very well. Um, and so I figured I'd, I'd head west. And go south of the border while i'm all, all already south mm -hmm. anyway and there's so that all of these things were built close to the border because like they got pushed out and in the same area you also have the mennonites a jehovah's witness sect it's like cult city it's a city of sudat kotemak and it's uh all places near that city uh which has all these bizarre cults that were kind of forced out of the u.s and so it's this this big cult culture strangely enough and Heber yes. Jets, that's interesting. Adam, Adam says yep. Heber Jets is from a place more. I did not know that. That, that is true. Yeah, he grew up with lots of brothers and sisters, I know. And oh, I Heber, don't even know who that is. So Heber Gents was the, uh, in name, uh, president of the Church of Scientology International. The last likable, oh. I should mm -hmm. know. The last likable spokesperson, the last mm -hmm. figure had to seem kind of like a nice guy. Yeah, he was definitely one that they would trot yeah. out to talk to media a lot back in the 80s and 90s. But he was another one of the executives who was banished to the hole at the international yes. base in uh, Riverside County, California, and hasn't been seen publicly since uh, uh, probably the mid 2000s at this point. And from what I've heard, he's now 88 years old. And from what I've heard, he's actually been relocated from the int base to a nursing home somewhere in. Well, actually, I don't know that his specific location is known. But from what we've heard from Karen De La Carrier, who is the wife of Jeffrey Augustine and oh, former yeah. wife of Heber Gench, she said that he's oh. been relocated to a to a nursing home. But yes, he was born into wow. a polygamous family. I didn't know that was his wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I always wonder why there is no Where's Heber movement, like there is a Where's Shelley. But I always feel like Shelley's partially evil herself. Or, well, Heber might have committed some evil stuff too. Well, wasn't Shelley disappeared? Like, well, be wasn't Shelley disappeared because she was starting to question David? I think that that was a big part of it. I think that a big part of the reason, though, that uh, there was more of a Where is Shelley that. Um, that 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 movement came a little bit more into fruition is that the other executives who were missing I did were a all bit, a little bit. Sorry. What was that? I was just uh, answering a co uh, comment real quick. Oh, got it, got <laughs> it, got, it, got it. Go ahead. Um, with all of the other executives like Heber Gench and Guillaume Leserve and uh, Mark Yeager, uh, and those are names of former executives who people who were Scientologists prior to the mid two thousands would recognize all of them were put into the hole. So then when folks like Mike Rinder started to leave, he was able to confirm that, yes, Heber Gench was in the hole, Guillaume Lesev was in the hole. Right. But Shelly right. was moved, she was moved away from the rest of them. And a, w kind of a theory that I've heard from a handful of those folks who have left is that Shelly was, if, if there was anybody who could have uh, overthrown David Miscavige and organized the others to rise up, it would have been her because she was the undisputed second in command. So I think that that's, I think that that's a big part of the reason that 
there was more of a where is to, someone needs to be uh timed out oh in the I chat did somebody it. okay yeah, someone's yeah. saying i did because someone people are making fun of me yeah, gotcha yeah let's yes i am non-binary everybody uh my pronouns are they them that means i do not oh, he's use actually a troller though his look at his name so yeah no. oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Ban, make sure uh, we're being respectful stuff. in the chat folks yeah i know that respect. some people uh forget but if you're being a dick on purpose then that's when i'm like uh, yes. uh. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I mean, honestly be curious and not know i don't know whose know. chat it's on i don't think it's on mine Honestly. That is one thing that's I tricky it, about yeah. StreamYard is that when we're when we're streaming to multiple channels at the same time, I'm not always clear yeah. if uh which which channel the chats are coming into. Yeah. Like it's yeah. nice to be able to see all the chats at the same time. Chats. Yeah, <laughs> could be, yeah, could be. Whoever said identify as a frog slash cat. Nah. Yeah, that's we don't yeah. need yeah. that in here. Been there, done it's, that, heard it all before. And I know again, like I don't get mad at people for messing up because yeah. it. It's like whatever. I misgender my own self sometimes by accident. Sure. <laughs> like, oops. I guess I'll yell at myself. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's fine. If people are being mean, then I just ignore it. It's like whatever. Respect. Yeah, that's that's a way to do that. And you know, some people just some people will refuse to understand that you yeah you identify you know not in a hyper masculine or hyper feminine way, and and you kind of beyond that yeah and i know i look very like traditional feminine so it's it's easy to forget um right but yeah i've always been gender fluid and like i always knew that like from the time i was really little but i didn't have the language for it and actually may i ask you yeah uh, with with that did you ever deal with that when you were a child in these awful programs or did you just pretend that you were never thinking about your gender identity and, and what identity fit you in your soul. Like, I wonder, did you ever let that come up or were you just way too scared because they would just strike that uh, down with um, a tongue in a second? I was, I guess, because I didn't know, I didn't have the language for a lot of things and I didn't know right. how to say anything. Sure. And I also was having a hard time trusting anybody in my life. I just right. kind of stayed silent. I just didn't talk about like yeah. many things. Right. Um, I you came out when I was right. 16. Right. I, I came out as bisexual when I was 16. Um, I did lose some friends. No, I'm sorry to hear that. Damn. It was the late, it was still the, it was still the nineties. Um, yeah. I feel like most people didn't start like uh, caring or I, I feel like the people I know now that are younger than me that came out, they had a way easier time in like, the later 2000s than before that time because right. even though it was still getting more accepted when i was in high school i st still had the stigma of like the matthew shepherd thing on my back like yeah Wyoming. i yep. didn't want to come out because of that I, yeah. I don't actually know know what that is i, I don't think i'm familiar oh. with matthew shepherd is that is that a big thing to get into or is that a, is well, that yeah, something that you're able to give us too long? Yeah. I mean, the quick story. TLDR is like, it was the Rodney King version of, uh, for the gay people. Oh my God. Hold on. Sorry. My cat just decided to knock everything over. Right. So this oh. is a young man, Laramie, Wyoming. Uh, who... Sorry. Oh, you're fine. I got my dog next to me. So uh, <laughs> she just like I slid off of a box. <laughs> Cats are even sillier, I think, than dogs. There we go. All right. <laughs> Somehow. We're all good. Are you okay? Are you okay over there? <laughs> yes, the cat eyes. Oh my god, yes. She really knocked everything over. I'm so sorry, guys. Awesome. I'm just gonna put everything on the floor yeah. until later. <laughs> Do what you got to do. I did look up Matthew Shepard and just reading the yes. Wikipedia entry here. Yeah, yes. this sounds this sounds like a tragic story. I actually kind of can't believe that I've never heard of this before, but I guess this was before I was born. So here's oh the gosh, troublemaker. That's terrible. Here's the troublemaker. No, I, I will say his his unlike a lot of other families because I worked in TV news in Wyoming, so I believe I got to meet Shepard's mother. Uh, oh, and I will oh. say, yeah, yeah, really inspiring figure. And I will say, especially in that neck of the woods in the 90s, 
I have respect for the parents for always understanding him. And like, that's the saddest part is that mm -hmm. Shepard, like had Shepard was lucky enough to actually have parents to accept him fully. And he still got like murdered. Just, yeah. you know, he, it is, it is, but she never quit. And she is the strongest anti-suicide advocate. She is the strongest LGBT advocate in the state. Um, and she has not, she has not quit, but yeah. 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 I mean, he's definitely but, not like, the first, um, because I mean, we had a uh, Stonewall before that. We had lots of other things that happened before that, but yes. in the nineties, when things were starting to get more accepted for gay people, right. there was still just a lot of people getting beat up for, you know, the, people could, could use the, uh, gay defense still back then I think I don't remember when they decided to um you can't use that defense anymore but basically yeah for most of the 90s you could use that as a defense like it was self-defense because they p made a pass on me or something like that right oh, gosh well I appreciate you <laughs> sharing all of that context I think that definitely that definitely kind of gives me gives me a little bit more context for like how you're entering the space and where where you approach activism and advocacy from and why it is important yeah. to you. So I appreciate you going into all of that. Uh, yeah. I am curious to maybe maybe change the subject a little bit, but Dodge, yeah, no. you you mentioned that you were uh, you were going to be coming back to California sometime soon to be uh, maybe paying attention to some of the trials or legal cases yeah. that are happening out here. Do you know yet when you're when you're looking at for that, or are you still? Yeah, I, are you still I, no, I mean, I was looking at the docket. I found it. It's like, when is the when does the trial actually begin? I want their pre preliminary motions are happening now, obviously. So I want it the sooner the better. Uh, I think that the trial kicks in at high gear more in October, November, would be my are guess. But I, but I'm curious. Like, what is the deal with that? Did most of it get thrown? I I saw I saw I haven't. Do you know what's up with that now? Are you talking about the Leah Remini civil lawsuit? Yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking. Right, there's a lot to keep track of, so maybe I'm yeah. going this month to cover. Uh, so yeah, the Leah Remini civil lawsuit. There was a report that came out a few days ago from Courthouse News Service, which mentioned that a chunk of the lawsuit had been thrown out by the judge, but uh, there was some additional reporting on it just over the last couple of days after right. the Courthouse News uh, Service report came out that indicated that actually there was only one cause of action that the judge really got rid of a lot of because yeah. Leah Remini is suing on several several different counts of action yeah, and one of them is defamation. And the judge has, has uh, removed some of the, essentially Scientology filed motions right. to strike for a lot of the lawsuit. And the no. judge did agree to strike some of the content that was related to defamation on the grounds that both parties are exercising their freedom of speech. That, um, oh yeah, and as Michelle Rumball says, uh, Aaron Smith-Levin and uh, your lawyer friend Zach do a great job of getting into getting into all the weeds on this. And of course, uh, Zach Morgan, he is he is an attorney, so he really knows what he's talking about. But uh, and so I said you can still sue that the harassment stuff is on the table, which yes, which yes, a lot of the harassment, stalking, that kind of stuff. Oh, uh, they will okay. still be able to get into that. There's a cool. few lawsuits yeah. that are, uh, and uh, October, I believe it's October of 2025, actually, when the trial is currently scheduled for, right, which is right. actually right around the same time as the trial for the Bixler v. Scientology lawsuit that's also yeah. going on right now. That's do, the civil lawsuit. Do you know lawsuit. how many actual lawsuits are collectively? Oh, gosh. Collectively. Yeah, right. So let me think. It's Because I can Remini. only think of like four on the top of my head. So I know that there's Leah Remini v. Scientology. There's Bixler v. Scientology. There's right. Jane Doe v. Religious Technology Center. Those are three that are uh, currently going on in California. And then there's also the, the Baxter. Australia one. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's in Florida, but it's filed by Australian Sea Org members. That's the Baxter v. Scientology case yeah. or Baxter v. Miscavige. And then there's also... Uh, case that's been forced into religious arbitration there's the valerie haney oh. uh lawsuit oh, that right. and, oh no they're going into arbitration see fuck that yeah. shit man yeah. fuck it yeah. they should yeah, not it's... be allowed to do that oh it makes me so <laughs> oh, yeah. it's it's awful it's all about revoking a tax exempt status they couldn't do religious arbitration if they got their 
tax exempt status revoked. So yeah, see, I know, goal, you know I know that if someone actually did a proper investigation, they could lose their tax exempt because they totally violate it. But yeah. when I look up the um history of getting tax exempt revoked it doesn't happen that often it doesn't happen that often and i think that a part of the reason for it is that uh the irs doesn't want to set a precedent of oh we can just do this to a church now and because if it happens to one church it can happen to it can happen to more and i think that that's it just should. a can of worms that oh i i, I completely agree i completely I agree <laughs> but i don't think Another another thing, uh, and this is something that I know Mike Rinder said to Tony Ortega some years ago when Tony asked him what Tony asked Mike, what do you think it's going to take for somebody in the government to actually take on Scientology? Mike said, the thing is, Scientology will put up such a fight that whoever it is in the government that decides to take that on has to make mm -hmm. a decision of, do I want this to be my new career? Do I want this to be the next yeah. 10 or more years of my life fighting and there's this cult. so many people that are afraid to even mention scientology completely i mean and that's changing especially with all of the protesting that's been happening over the last few months i think mm -hmm. that we are starting to see somewhat of a cultural shift about who and who is or isn't afraid to talk about it because now all of these folks who are out on the streets every night in la are showing they're fearless their folks are willing to get arrested and spend arrested, a few nights yeah. in jail and then still come back to protest more. That's, that's been, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's, it's always, feel, it's never fun to see people get I arrested. I feel really bad for DOA. He's been yes. leaving protests early because I think he's, he's pretty traumatized by getting swatted. Yeah, I mean, right. that should, yeah. I mean, that would just traumatize anybody. I don't know how Jessica was like keeping her cool. I would have been a mess if that happened to me. I've yeah. been amazed by how well Jessica is able to keep her cool in every situation that she's in. It's it's really remarkable. And she's been a real leading figure as far as yeah. just mobilizing people to want to get back out there and yeah. get on the and streets, which is really like awesome. She Scientology stuff before, so she already had no, it. Yeah. So she was like, screw it. Let's no, listen. yeah, that's 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 been an interesting thing is that so many of the folks, uh, folks who have started coming out back a few months ago when folks are regularly in front of the Hollywood Testing Center, which is right. now shut down. A lot of those a lot of those folks hadn't paid attention to Scientology at all until just a couple of months ago. Oh, no. And it's yeah. been awesome to see to see how how devoted of activists they have how they have become. I see Peter Foster says, I don't get it. Why? England refused tax exemption for Scientology a long time ago. Yeah. So as I understand, as well, right? a po which one? Canada as well. Canada I... didn't, didn't give them tax exempt. I think you're right about that. And specifically and... for England. Oh, go ahead. Oh, oh I was just going to say, I think Engl they had it in England and England revoked it. Yeah. And apostate Alex, who has uh, organized some protests out in England, he's done a good job That's of laying out what the rules are uh, for tax exempt organizations and religious organizations to receive tax exempt status in England. And they have a higher burden of proof as far as proving yes. to the government that they are doing a public a public good, a public service, where that that's, doesn't seem to be something in the United States that religious organizations are required to continually prove. It seems that once you have tax exempt status in the US, it's... It, it it it's not common that it gets revoked, even if regardless of whether or not you're proven to have uh, contributed a public good to society. But apostate Alex is definitely definitely a good person to refer to when understanding the differences between uh, obtaining and maintaining tax exempt status in England as opposed to in the United States. Oh, also, uh, I went out to my first Scientology protest. Oh, how, how was, was it? Um. It was fine. It was a little weird, only because it's such a weird organization. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. So there was, it's like in a very weird spot. Um, there's nothing but like businesses around it. It's right across from our Department of Licensing. There's like one apartment building, and there's like barely any foot traffic. <laughs> and it seems like this is where they send their elderly, because there I saw no young people. It was all like. 16 yes. above some of them there's there's not worth protest because there's not much foot traffic to begin with or in there are some isolated areas so it's like 
Yeah, and really the only way, the only thing that they were doing with recruiting, because obviously when me and Laura, um, Laura Font got there, they locked the doors on us. Um, but I guess they had like the other day flashed a knife to somebody. Oh. Yeah, there's a video of one of them at the Seattle org pulled a knife and flashed it, at, like pulled it out of his pocket and flashed it at the the guy. I think his name Ow. is Moose on the Loose. Thirty eight. Okay, I'll check him out. Moose on the Loose. Yeah. I will have to check that out. Nationwide um, now. This is awesome. And so I was a little bit freaked out, but I'm like, what is, what are they actually going to do with that? Well, you know, I, I don't I, think I, they're going to like <laughs> try and stab us. <laughs> I mean, but, I would hope, but I mean. Yeah, I'm always curious. I, I want your opinion on something very quickly where we're talking about the repercussions for going to these protests because uh, yeah. I went to the protest in Chicago and, yeah. you know, I was, a, a pretty they, they recognize us pretty loud boisterous voice and one of the dude in the beard who's been identified I forget his name but he was also uh threatening shannon and her dog uh mm -hmm. chicago scientology on it he was saying mm -hmm. hey because we we're thinking about like storming the stage we never did uh and obviously getting arrested and the guy's like hey dodge you have warrants i'm like what are you talking about? He's like, and i'm like what what do i have warrants for and he says for crimes you have warrants for crimes and I thought that's the weirdest, like, no, I don't. Uh, but then it was interesting because I flew from Atlanta to Chicago. And so I went to Chicago, flew back. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm not the most embarrassed person. I'm, I'm a pretty open person. So I was found in a in suburban Atlanta because I want to see a friend in Cobb County smoking marijuana in a car. Off The car was off outside my hotel. Police knocked on the door, arrested me. I spent 16 hours in jail. But then, I, but at each time in the jail, everybody was saying the whole time they'd never seen anybody. I had a uh, an eighth of an ounce of marijuana. They said they'd never seen anybody with under an ounce of marijuana spend the full day in jail. And then I Googled like marijuana prosecutions, Cobb County. And it said that the sheriff in 2019 issued an order for his officers not to arrest people and book them for simple marijuana misdemeanor possession. So I, I'm probably being paranoid. I was thinking about making a video about it, but I don't know. Scientology does have a church in Sandy Springs in suburban Atlanta, and they have honored the police force there. So I always do wonder, do they really try to look out for you? Uh, and, 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 and I said in my live stream what hotel I was at, too, or implied it. I said I was at a hotel. Not there anymore. I was at a hotel and a golf course. So they, and, and I said that like three hours and three hours later uh, that I got booked. Yeah, I, I'm sorry that that happened to you, but I'd say Thanks. that there's a yeah. good chance. I'd say there's a good chance that that's not a coincidence that right. uh, yeah. Scientology has honored the cops yeah. out there. I mean, we've definitely right. seen with the protesting that's been happening now in L.A. that the LAPD does not tend to like the protesters who have been protesting no, against true. Scientology. I mean, cops in general don't like protesters. Right. I think that is I think that right. is true. Um, we do know with the LAPD that there is a considerable history of corruption because we've seen lots of images of uh, LAPD officers accepting those big checks on the stages at Scientology galas yeah. or uh, yeah. right. the, that Scientology kiosk was even in the uh, LAPD Wilcox station for for a while. It got taken yeah. down after uh, receiving some receiving some backlash once it was more publicized. But, oh, yeah, there's definitely a history of corruption there. And I would That's not scary. doubt that something similar yeah. was going on that led to, led to, my gosh. Right. You never know. Um, Cause it, yeah. Because they have a lot of these tactics and they have friends in a lot of places. Yeah. So this person, Linda, says that Laurie Place said tonight on a live stream, she just found out that they are paying taxes on a few places in Clearwater that have been yes. empty for years. So I yeah. did oh, find sure. out. I don't remember which state it was in. I think it was an M state, but there was um, an, a building that they bought. And for the past 20 years, apparently they've been saying that they're going to get it fixed up and they're going to get contractors. They don't, they don't have the contractor yet. And now the city is going to tax them because it's an eyesore. They keep saying they're going to do something with the building and they just never have. Um, oh, well, that's definitely something that Scientology has a history of doing. I know that yeah. there was a building in, in I'm pretty sure that in it was Seattle, Clearwater. there's another one, too. So uh, there's two places. There's the org, which was the one I was at. And then there's a place downtown on Literal Drug Alley that is the Improvement Center. But you go by there, the doors are locked, 
it's empty. There's just mm. L. Ron Hubbard books and that's it. And it, and it's right next door to the McDonald's where people literally are shooting up and everything. There's drug deals there. It's like a very notorious area. So I'm like, why the hell is there an improvement center right there that well, like nobody's in, nobody yeah. does anything with it. Why? Just why? <laughs> yeah. Gosh. Yeah. I, I know like, that it's a history. Oh, go ahead. But yeah, like, so when I was at the org, they basically were, um, I got approached by one Scientologist. Um, yeah. And he basically was doing the, the typical victim blaming thing of like, well, I've never seen anybody get abused. So right. it must not happen. And then I had my big board that had the list on it and i was like talk to any of these people on this list and then he just kind of looks at it and he's like oh i've seen some of that crap like i don't believe it basically mm -hmm. um and he's like well i've been in it for 50 years and it's don't you want to hear about how, the good things that scientology does and i said i don't care i care about people being abused i don't care what good you've gotten out of it when some some when it's destroying people's lives. Well, look at all the people they made clear though. I mean, that's something to be proud of. Yeah, there's, and it's weird because I started shaking because I wasn't sure exactly the right things to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was starting to get like, I didn't want to get mean. Um, and his little smug look on his face just made me want to get there. <laughs> and I was just like, ah! <laughs> I didn't know what to do. But I think I did okay. People saw it. And they thought I did all right. Um, and I brought a newbie Thanks. with me, my friend who never goes to anything like this, doesn't really know anything about anything. Um, and so it sounded like the Scientologist was trying to recruit him a little bit and then saying that, oh, you need to find better friends to hang out with. That's what he said to him. Right. Interesting. <laughs> You know, that's what somebody at the sheriff's department said to me when I was at the courthouse for DOA's arraignment was you oh, should get yeah? better friends because <laughs> I kept running. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. They were wow. not a fan. Well, uh, I guess to change the subject really quick and just explain part of what happened there. We saw we saw officers pretty brutally uh, attack one of the one of the prison one of the inmates who was in the cage in the courtroom. So this kind of courtroom that we were in uh, oh. was in the criminal court. And this wasn't like the courtroom that uh, Danny Masterson's trial was in, um, mm -hmm. where there's a place for the jury to sit. This was a place where arraignments happen after people are arrested. So there's actually a what looks like a bullpen, basically, in the courtroom uh, where the inmates are brought in, still in handcuffs. Yeah, and yeah. one guy, it was a tall black guy, uh, he received... Uh, he received what, whatever the judge said. I honestly don't remember all the details of his case or exactly what the judge said, but he, she ordered him back into custody. And I guess he made some comment or maybe he even spat or something, but the cops, uh, the sheriffs, one sheriff punched him in the face and then they, wow. they grabbed him and smashed his head oh. into the plexiglass and not, brought him down to the floor. And I was in the room with folks like yeah. Chris without a Hellcat well, and Easy Quick. I couldn't really tell what was going on. That's scary. Mm -hmm. But they started yelling, that's a dirty cop. That's a dirty cop. And then we were all cleared out of the courtroom and they were, yeah. oh gosh. Yeah, it was an, it was an intense moment. Wow. And on that, yeah. Peter, wow. I don't know if that would work, Peter. LAPD know the trouble that's been going on. Why don't they post one officer to oversee the protests? Because they're not going to be on the protesters' side at all. It doesn't right. matter. Right. Um, right. I mean, I I mean Scientology they, gets in their bread and butter. Yeah. I mean, and if it wasn't Scientology, they're there to protect the businesses. Like, that's what cops do. They protect property and businesses Robert. over people. Um, and I've told Jacob before that I have had m many experiences with protests in various different ways. Like the 2021 was probably the worst I've ever seen. Um, only because I was also right in the middle of where the police station is. Like all that protest was happening in my neighborhood. Was this and, a Black Lives Matter protest? Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and so the police were... Uh, they were driving around blasting their sirens late at night they were um just so much tear gas and it's not even tear gas it was like what uh 
CO2 or something like that. It was like a heavier duty one. They were even shooting oh, wow. like bullets at people. I watched people oh, on live wow. stream like almost die. There was God. a guy who makeshifted a pistol and came into the middle of the protest and tried to shoot people, but because it was janky, it didn't go off. So he didn't oh my actually, God. Oh my he God. ended up, he ended up shooting one person through the arm that was trying to pull him out of his car. And then guess what he did? He, as soon as he gets pulled out of his car, he gets loose, runs to the cop line and the cops protect him. Oh my gosh. It, and it's just like, we get all of this on live stream, right? We have the evidence, but nothing ever changes. Right. We thought it's that things might change when Rodney King happened because we got it on film, right? Sure, George. And here Spider. we are in 2023, 2024, nothing has changed. Yeah, right. And when it comes to protesting against police brutality, it's unfortunately not that, it's too like surprising. That pol- yeah. It felt like more like a war. And like, not only do we have the police story about here, um, we have we have a section of Proud Boys uh, oh. that just would walk up and down the street. It's Northwest, like, it's filled with that. It's a weird scene yeah. over there with all the skinheads. Yeah, and it's yeah. It's very weird. Um, they're all nerds. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they do. They they have like just gone around and like just beat people up for. I got pushed yeah. in a oh crowd by one of them. Um, I mean. Yeah. It's why I don't really like putting my stuff, my, my, my own body out there anymore because I'm also disabled. Yep. And people were going out to these protests with their kids and stuff thinking, oh, this is going to be a great protest. We're teaching our kids something good. Yeah. And then a kid gets, a seven-year-old got pepper sprayed in the face. Oh, no. And it's like, no, stop bringing your kids out. Disabled people probably shouldn't be out here because do you think the, the cops care if you're disabled? No. Do you think the cops are going to care if I need my medication or I'm going to pass out? No. <laughs> like, I can't afford to get arrested. Plus, I'm a teacher. So, like, I have to sort of try and protect right, myself schedule. as much as possible, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, so that's why, like, I'm, I'm good with what I'm doing now. Like, with the Scientology stuff, I'm really good with technology. I'm a photographer. I'm a filmmaker, graphic design. Uh, I got you on those fronts. So I finally decided to you know, stay away from the street as much as possible. Yeah, I did go to the protests for Scientology, but I didn't think it was going to get, you know, out of hand or anything, and it didn't. And I know that if cops show up, I'm just going to bounce because I don't want to have to deal with that. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely try to do what I can to not not intentionally escalate situations. And it's something that I definitely have a different approach than some folks who are out there on the street with me. I, I just tend to be, uh, I tend to be a calmer person. I feel like in when, when I can tell yeah. that an, uh, that a, the con- conversation or confrontation is starting to get heated, I'm not generally going to be one who will be likely to get up in someone's face with the camera and start screaming at them. Right, yeah. so, mm-hmm. Some folks are like that. And Hey, that's, that's some folks approach. I'm not, I'm not looking to knock them, but I do still film because I want to make sure mm-hmm. that the things that we do out there are documented and that they're documented yeah. from multiple angles because exactly. this, I particularly realized this was important when Aaron was uh, detained uh, when he came into LA a couple of months ago because he was he was clearly punched in the head by that guy with the pit bull who came up yeah, to him. Absolutely. And yeah. if you we look at his it. live stream, if you look at his live stream, you can see the you can see the punch the, the punch being thrown, but you don't actually see it make contact with him. On the other right. streams who are around, you can. And it was then that I kind of realized because before that I had been going to protest but not really streaming much. And once I, I just kind of figured. I, do I really need to be just another angle out there when there's already so many? And after that day was when I kind of realized, you know what? Yeah, if I'm going to be there, might as well be getting another another uh, instance of documentation, another angle to be used to help help protect the protesters if necessary. And yeah. I'd certainly and speaking haven't regretted of, of documentation, mm-hmm. how do we find out how much is getting donated by Scientology? To the question. police. Yeah, like how do we find out the donations amounts? Are that's a good question. Is there a way I, to? 
discussion. I would think that, that because the police are publicly funded, that that should be publicly available information. But I actually don't know. That could be something. How, yeah, something I don't know how to get, get a hold into. of that. I know how to look up people's business licenses because I was keeping track of a rapist here. <laughs> Oh, sorry, YouTube grapist. He's not. Oh, you're right. It's, <laughs> you're full enough. We're an hour and 30. Into I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I think it's mainly at the beginning of the stream that we need to yeah. worry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, we had a um, a business owner here who was um, kind of like the music venue mogul. So he opened up like he was a bunch of venues. He was the owner of them, a bunch of restaurants. And when it a uh, big, huge article came out about him and all the women that came forward. He did lose some of his ownerships, but I kept every three months I would go and like look to see what he had. And he started buying new things. And so I would have to like alert people like, oh, this is his new his new business. And then people would go and like write rapists um, on the sidewalk. Like, because I, I don't know, I feel like that is a I'm an artist. I can do that. Just give me some That's talk. Art. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a I like, I like all the, the talk art that DOA yeah. was doing. DOA. Oh yeah, I was. Th that's exactly what I was thinking of as you were starting to talk about writing that outside. He's he's really had a lot of fun doing the doing the artwork outside La Poubelle, and I've loved to see it every time I've gone out there and seen all that he's done. Yeah, the one thing I mean, I do worry about the protesters that do get in people's faces because it it i don't want them to get uh, accidentally shot or i don't know some a knife pulled on them if they're like going up to the wrong person yeah, yeah, i mean box. we've already seen some assaults happen like what what happened to uh streets the other night was pretty hard for me to watch and i was watching live the whole time and i was like almost having a panic attack and i had to call lara <laughs> be like oh my god what is happening <laughs> Um, and so we've seen some of that happen and it's like, what if, what if like one of, one of the people you get in their face does do something really bad? Like that's, that's the risk that you're taking, but the, I True. really worry about that stuff because like nope. we see it in road rage incidences. No. Yeah. I mean, particularly after, after, uh, Aaron was detained and then after uh Danny and Cam and DOA were arrested it it has been something that I've been increasingly starting to realize more and more that if we're going to continue to come out here we are taking we are taking a risk so mm -hmm. we do have to be we do have to be informed we have to know how to be smart out there and the thing yeah. is in LA we're we're not a we're not a formal formally organized group with uh rules or standards like we're all yeah. at the end of the day individuals who are going mm -hmm. to approach situations in the way that we best see fit and sometimes we'll have different approaches and i honestly i i think that that is okay to have different approaches and different personalities within you the don't group. think it will hurt the movement to have different fit different folks with different approaches within the group yeah. i mean as long i as do folks worry about that i've heard like i mean i don't I, I, because I, I have my own opinions about things. I just take in what other people say to me, but like some it's people good. have said to me that they're afraid that the ones that are more aggressive are going to hurt the overall message and movement and people won't want to listen at all. But nobody's gotten that. It's a good point, but nobody's gotten that hardcore. I don't, you know, nobody's hit anybody, you know, no, or anybody. no, no, none of the protesters have work. done that, but I mean, getting in people's faces and yelling at people sure. is can be seen Stuff as like a too. threat yeah. to somebody else. Right. So right. those are the only things that I worry about. Like, I'm not the type of person that yells at people because I mean, unless I'm really getting into it and I have backup, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just too sh I feel like I'm too shy sometimes to get. I couldn't. In I couldn't. I was there. I couldn't be as aggressive as some of the other people. I just can't. You know. Yeah. Like I, that's my maybe my problem. Like I still feel like I want to protect some of these people, but they are Scientologists and they are complicit in all this stuff. But then part yeah. of me is like, I don't want to be mean to somebody else. But I think that's something that I have to get over. But yeah, it's yeah. hard. I think I was. I'm just. I was more worried about the people who this was like their first time protesting because I'm like, oh, they don't know what they're doing out there. Like, I just want to protect them like they're all babies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but I've also been in some yeah. hardcore protests, and this is not, you know, a war against the police. I mean, it kind of is at this point a little bit, but 
honestly, like if you guys weren't filming everything, I wouldn't even be sure if the LAPD was being paid off. Right. Like, we can right. see this stuff now. Mm-hmm. And it, it does kind of suck because I, I, I have like now a mistrust uh, a bit of people um, in terms of like, you don't know who is a Scientologist or who's on your side or who's against you when like you are coming up against people on the street. It's like, are they a plan or was this just a coincidence? Right. That's where I'm like, I start to get a little bit paranoid because it's like, was that a coincidence? Like, was that just a fluke thing or was that an actual plant? Because right. you, when you do see get paranoid, strategic things, it starts to make you really paranoid about everything. No. Yeah. And it can be, I, I think that, uh, Sometimes Scientology wants folks to be paranoid in that sense. They oh, want them. Yeah. They want people to be questioning everything around them. They, they want people to feel power. crazy, and get in their head. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that definitely is is a factor that plays into all of it. And uh, there was a comment that uh, Chrissy never in Newton put in the chat. Everyone has yeah. their own fight and flight and trauma. And yeah. yeah, I think that that is another thing that is just going to is just going to be another influencing factor in why why some folks are going to respond differently to certain situations yeah. but at the end of the day based on the the situations that i personally have been in so far i don't feel that i've seen things that are going to hurt the movement as a whole i think that different folks have different approaches to certain situations and that's okay i mean in the event that some folks who uh do protest on the streets in la do get out of control or do cross a line i think that there's a, there would be a healthy and respectful way to communicate that to them without without uh undermining their efforts um although well every day is a new day the truth is every day that we go out there we never know what's going to happen we never know what we're going to catch on film what we're going to yeah. see who's going to who's going to show up but folks keep continuing to show up and folks keep continuing to speak out against the abuse and that's the that's the important part. That's that's really the part that I love to see in all of this. Yeah, Jacob, Jacob, I'm I'm curious for somebody that's on the ground. What do they mm-hmm. mean by you know? And I I should be more important about this. But what do they mean by they literally shut shut it down? You know, the center in LA. Does that mean they're not practicing? Does that mean they're not standing outside trying to recruit people anymore? I'm curious, like what that exact definition is. So they're yeah they don't even open the doors anymore from what I've seen they're uh basically that okay. that test center on Hollywood Boulevard oh, test center. that's yeah. that's kind of a unique location in that uh oh, you can only question. do the introductory personality test and very very intro stuff there it's not a typical right. org where you can go on course and it's, I didn't do know all that. that that's yeah bizarre huh. they call they call it the it's Scientology Information Center I believe is what it's called so the but L, there's typ- is there no LA org then or is the oh other yeah okay. the LA org the LA org is uh a few miles away so there's a there's a, a handful of Scientology locations in the LA right. area but yeah the test center that's on hollywood boulevard that place was really more than anywhere else getting the most foot traffic because hollywood boulevard is just such a popping tourist place and so that would be people right yeah Mm -hmm. and they would they would actually get to get people who are walking down the street particularly folks who did not speak english tourists who are spanish speakers they were really able to because they they often were less likely to even be familiar with scientology at all So right, right. once uh, William and Jessica and the other folks that followed started to uh, started to warn people who were going in, oh, don't go in there. It's a cult. It's a cult or es una secta in Spanish. Right. Then the movement just grew to the point that every night that they allowed that they continued to open the center was just continuing to give folks outside an opportunity to blow up on social right. media and to yeah. cause a scene outside. And eventually, I want to say that it's been seven weeks or so now uh they've they've stopped opening the place up they've stopped uh, they've i thought they the opened up spent. one day oh you know what uh, that last week or something i think that there was one day or one day yeah. or so last week that they did open up but um yeah i have to I, I meant to go back and watch some of the footage from uh that jessica posted from when it was back open but i i don't know if they went if i haven't I, the truth is i haven't uh driven past it in a few That's days anonymous now, so protested in LA before? Because I know oh, yeah. that Anonymous protested here when the org was opened here. 
yeah, I'm sure that picture, they've purchased it other places. There's a picture that I've seen from I think it was 2008 when uh, the, a lot they all had their uh, Guy Fox masks out in front of the uh, ASHO, the American Saint Hill Organization, which is right next to Big Blue on L. Ron Hubbard Way. And yeah, I'm pretty sure that was 2008. I don't hear much from Anonymous anymore uh, these days, but oh, oh yeah, there. Would you say? I wonder what happened because they were good allies in this whole scene. You know, they just, yeah, I, I think I, they're I, still I doing stuff, but I feel like they just don't protest that much. They're mostly doing things behind the scenes, I think. And like so, online yeah. hacktivism. Yeah, all that. who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Um, but about the, uh, the question that I had brought up about yeah. if we would um, protest other religions. I mean, I'm protesting religion in general all the time. Whenever I talk to people, I feel like. Because I, I mean, I have my own trauma with religion in general, and yeah. I don't think any child should be indoctrinated. I don't I, think I that we can ever make that a, a thing in reality, but knowing how a uh, child development goes, like, I just don't think religion is good for a developing mind. Like, sure, when you're older and you or looking for something or whatever, but, um, and it could just be my own, my own trauma makes me feel that way, but I've seen every religion hurt people. So it's I like, I don't know. I think you're definitely right that there, there is a lot of, many different religious organizations have caused that kind of trauma to developing minds. I don't know if I, uh, it's it's honestly difficult for me to comment on because I was never really a religious person. I didn't grow up in a no, religious household. I didn't grow up going to church, so I, I I can't speak to speak from personal experience about what uh what it was like for me. But um, as far as the question of would you protest other religions? Look, if there's if there's evidence of documented abuse and a lack of accountability. Then yeah, I mean that's that's really what the what the like purpose and the core of the protest comes down to. Most of them. I mean, your Unitarians are pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, as far well, as it. spirituality, I guess I I do I, I call myself a witch. I am a Wiccan, <laughs> but I will never nice. join another religion or a coven or a group right. thing. I get that. Like I do it all on my own, my little crystals. <laughs> <laughs> my my affirmation cards like that's what gets me through my days now um mm. but i know that there is a connection of scientology and and the nation of islam right yeah so yeah. as i understand what happened there uh isaac hayes who is chef on south park and yeah. he was a scientologist i guess I approached him, david miscavige like, quitting and said, or something what? He quit, well, yeah, I think he was forced to quit South Park after they oh, made the okay. Scientology episode. Yeah. But he approached David Miscavige at some point and said, "Why aren't you? Why aren't you recruiting my people? Why aren't you doing more to Trust get my people in?" Mm -hmm. And uh, it was shortly after that that I think David Miscavige, and this was covered in an episode of the Aftermath in uh, the Aftermath TV show in season three. Yeah, I um, sort of remember a little bit about it. But I guess uh, David Miscavige decided that the Nation of Islam was the way in to the black community. And so he wined and dined Louis Farrakhan, who is the uh, leader right, right, of the right. Nation of Islam. Yeah. And uh, that led Louis Farrakhan to essentially determine that the only uh, white people who could be trusted are Scientologists. And the only white people allowed into uh, NOI mosques are Scientologists who are teaching Scientology and because for the most part uh, black over white people are not allowed in in those NOI mosques and um, oh really mm -hmm. but hmm. the, the thing that's weird and that doesn't totally make sense and that several ex Scientologists have commented on is the fact that in order to progress up the bridge to total freedom in Scientology, you can't be practicing other faiths. So right. Louis Farrakhan has said that, oh, L. Ron Hubbard's study technology can help uh, folks in the Nation of Islam. To Yeah, yeah right. the, Peter Foster's got the answer right there. <laughs> Money talks, that's why. Yeah. I mean, that's um, what I'm seeing is like people are fine with abuse, especially to children, as long as there's money involved. 
Right. That That's just like the bottom line that I'm seeing in any of these like cases of cults or religions. And I also wanted to say something to this. Scientology is not unique building abuse into their policies and practices. You're right. I think you're right because about that. Because in my religion, we have an actual book about how to abuse your children properly according to their policies and it's called how to train up a child you can still buy this book i have it for free (laughs) i found it on the way back machine someone archived it um but yeah you can just go on amazon and there's a smiley little child on the front cover and they talk about at this age you use this size switch and it's always on bare skin because you want to inflict the most pain as possible but appropriate for the age of the child and then as you age up uh the implement gets bigger gets harder like and that's just the the scratching the surface of it um there's food withheld as punishment which i was i i couldn't eat anything in my house without asking like if my grandmother heard me going in the cabinets she would immediately be like what are you looking, looking for what are you getting wow tell her what i wanted to eat yeah and so all of this like yeah scientology is not unique in this look up children of god oh children children of god fishing of course the sex cult yeah it's one of the most disgusting with children that i've ever heard literally disgusting and they they make sexual depictions encouraging kids to have sex with their elders as young as four years old what? David Berg, right? Yeah. Oh my god. That's and uh, Joaquin That's Phoenix bad. and his brother grew up in it. Yeah, oh. yeah right. Right. Uh-huh. River Phoenix and Joaquin, right? They both grew up in it. Yeah. I did not know that. That is yeah. Nice to me. And oh. River Phoenix did not survive. Mm-hmm. Literally. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, they're the only celebrities I know that were in it. I'm sure there might be others. Um, and yeah, one I'm of the others, but I can't remember. Who they and were. one of the girls that uh, is like a cult expert now, a scholar of like you know bad leadership and extremely bad groups. Um, her name is Daniela or Danielle. I can't remember. Young, no. and she grew up in Children of God. And then as soon as she got out of that, she went into another cult called the army. (laughs) Um, And so she compares them as well, like the cult, like atmospheres and and stuff that you do, especially she got up to captain and she says it gets worse the higher you go up. I do. I have heard her talk. She went on a little bit culty with uh, Sarah and Nippy from Nexium. And yeah, she's, I I have heard her story. She's Rose McGowan. She's a trailblazer. Rose McGowan group in Children of God. Yeah, right. Really? I asked you that one. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Oh, Gosh. I'm actually friends with one of her cousins. Her one of her younger cousins lives oh, right cool. near me, <laughs> and she's a musician mm. as well. <laughs> wow, that's cool. So, cool. Yeah. <laughs> All um, right. But uh, I enjoy this conversation. I feel like we could talk forever, but uh, we yeah, probably totally. should wrap it up. <laughs> yeah, you know, there were a yeah, couple of comments that I starred. There were yeah. a couple of uh, chats that yeah, came in that I starred because uh, uh, I wanted to circle back to them really quick before we wrap yes. up. Oh, yeah. Do you want to get that one real quick? Um, mine was Southern Baptist. So I grew up with a very strict Southern Baptist household. I guess I still had like a normal childhood and did all the latchkey type things. Right. Um, but I, you know, still had a very weird, strict upbringing. And I knew that my household was weird because I would go into my friends' houses and I'm like, this is nothing like my house. And I adopted, I made all my friends' parents adopt me (laughs) because I'm like, please don't send me home. I don't want to go. Oh, I laughed through the pain. Oh gosh. Hey, it's a good way to handle it. And you help people through the pain too. So respect them. That's true. Yeah. Okay. What are the things that are start? Can we get through? So yeah. Uh, Donnie Lee Gringo in Brazil, I think this was toward the beginning of the stream yeah, when yeah. Dodd, you were talking about working for the TV. Uh, he asked, do local anchors write their own copy for the teleprompter? That's a very good question. Yeah, yes and no. Uh, on Mostly no, because, all right, so there are two totally separate things when you read the news. There's the national stories, and then there's the local stories that your local news reporter 
produces and submits. The local news reporter for their local story will submit copy. In some stations, they'll just submit it. Some, the anchor will take a look. I was so relaxed. I just gave it a glance. But I technically uh, read the copy that the anchor was giving me to read. I mean, that the reporter was giving me to read about their story. And then nationally is when we had a lot less input. No, nationally, you are supposed to download from your parent network any national story. And you have some liberty in choosing the national story. Uh, but, um, you're supposed to, and you have to be categorical because, you know, all your viewers are old. So you have to do like a health section, uh, and then like an elderly se- and there's like, it's all catered towards old people. Now the majority of people watching TV news are over the age of 65. Um, and so you, you have to have the specific, you have to have the state news. You have to have a state news story. You have to have a health news story. You have to have your local stuff. And then you might have two minutes to play around with an extra thing. So the Scientology thing was my extra thing where you could add it. But yeah, you're supposed to copy and paste, but there's there's no hard and fast rules. So even previously, I would make up my own script or, you know, like I I there found an interesting development when Carrie Lake, she was running for uh, Senate uh, or governor in Arizona. And, you know, she was trying to sue and I found this information before and then found it. So I put it in and wrote my own copy. Or when our local Senator Kirsten Cinema decided she was switching parties, CNN didn't have anything, but I saw in Politico it had something. So I wrote my own. But you're supposed to copy and paste from CNN, but it's not a hard and fast rule. Mm-hmm. Most people do it. Yeah, because as I said, people in TV news, if you're successful, you don't actually like the news. Because if you like news, you analyze it too much and then you want to tell the truth. I, I, I hate to say it, but if you're seeing your guy in NBC Chicago, he's probably an idiot. That's how he made believe it. that. <laughs> I actually have a really hard time watching anything the news related unless it's an independent yeah, they're, they journalist. Suck. They're mean. They're actually mean people, too. They they thought I was ridiculous. and I never – I mean, in the last station, I was relatively respected because I was an anchor. But as a, a news reporter, I was, you know, everybody thought I didn't take myself too serious, seriously enough. And they're, they're a kind of mean type A people that are not like normal human beings. I would, they're very good at following orders and not questioning things. Mm-hmm. And always do the right thing. You know, since they were a child, they got straight A's and went to a great, and yeah. I was like, man, I don't fit in with any of these jerks. I mean, that's also why my church didn't want to deal with me anymore. Cause you're not supposed to ask questions right. and I asked that's too many right. questions. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're all under some sort of control, and it's said, and, and they're yeah. renegades that, bust, that try to bust through it and, and make some progress doing so. What was well, the cause of Lisa Marie? Yeah, that was the next one that I saw here. Uh, d- no worries. What was the cause of death of Lisa Marie? Did the Church of Scientology cult make it happen? Uh, so the yeah, that's cause what of I death. I'm wondering. The cause of death, uh, according to the Los Angeles County Medical Examiner's Office, was uh, bowel obstruction, which was a result of adhesions caused by weight loss surgery she underwent several years ago. So assuming that the Los Angeles County Medical Examiner's Office is uh, being truthful here, it doesn't appear Mm -hmm. that there was foul play by the church. But I know that you're not the only one to wonder that. That was that is a question. I I didn't work in it. Right. I didn't go there when I wrote that story or nor in the subsequent interviews with Tony Ortega or anybody else or Aaron, but many people brought it, brought it up. Uh, and listen, Kirstie Alley, that was a very young death too. There's been some weird stuff. So it's, it's interesting to, to think twice about. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, Linda asked what boggles my brain. And I think that this question came in as we were talking about Lisa Marie Presley, uh, revealing that she participated in obstruction of justice on behalf of the church. What boggles my brain is a prosecutor for the state heard that, but then doesn't have church of Scientology investigated. So actually on this note, uh, when I attended Danny Masterson's sentencing, uh, the prosecuting attorney, uh, Reinhold Mueller did a press conference outside the courthouse where a handful of journalists were standing outside asking questions. And I actually asked, uh, can we expect to see an obstruction of justice charge be brought against the church soon? And what he said was, best way I can answer that is that I can't answer that. (laughs) Because if there is an open investigation, it's not something that I'm allowed to comment on at this time. And that's, that's about what I expected to hear. I wasn't expecting to get too much, but I wanted to say it in front of the prosecutor so that now he has heard... And 
at the end of the day, I'm not even sure who prosecutes uh, which department of the district attorney's office would prosecute um, would pro or which division, I should say, of the district attorney's office mm -hmm. would prosecute obstruction of justice charges because uh, Reinhold Mueller, as I understand, is in the sex crimes division. And I don't know if somebody obstructed justice within a within a sex crime case, if it, that obstruction of justice charge would be prosecuted by the sex crimes division or if there's a different department or different division entirely that does obstruction of justice. The truth is, I don't hear about obstruction of justice being prosecuted very often so it's something that i would love to know the answer to oh. but uh but it's a good question the good good i'm glad you brought it yeah. up Linda, and from what i've heard is that there has been some investigations in prior years but someone always tips them off i wouldn't doubt it no. i think i've even i don't know I, I don't like misinformation i don't quote me on this i think I think I heard something from Aaron talking about the dorms in Clearwater one time had to be turned over to look nicer because there was going to be someone coming in. Like it, oh, it, I believe CPS that. has been called, like police have been there, like FBI has been there, but I guess they get tipped off to like make things look better. Yeah. I don't I, know I how know fast that. you can make things look better, but yeah. gosh. Oh, oh yeah, no. I definitely wouldn't put any of that past them. Here's a question then, I have for oh, uh, yeah. for you two though. Like Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I also I feel such existential dread going into stuff like this and then it makes me feel like well then what's the point of me even doing any of this if nothing is ever going to completely stop abuse especially to children. Like do you ever feel defeated? Like like you don't want to keep going with this cuz what's the point? Honestly, I don't. Because when I go out there and get on the streets and protest, I mm -hmm. tend to feel a very strong sense of purpose. Like yeah. every, just about every time I've protested, obviously when friends of mine have been arrested, those days are disheartening. Those days are not the most uplifting. Great job covering days. Danny and Leah, by the way, and talking about all of that and getting the yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, but for the most part, when I go to a protest, I leave feeling good and feeling like, I just right. participated in working toward justice and it may be a small step in a grand when what's ultimately a mm -hmm. marathon, but I, it, it feels good to do. It feels good to stand in solidarity with others. And it's something that, yeah. But, and let me gather my thoughts for a sec. <laughs> Basically I, I enjoy protesting and I feel, I feel that even if, even if things are happening on a small scale, Every step counts. And mm -hmm. honestly, seeing folks get arrested, I know that that's the kind of thing that will turn some people away and make some yeah. people feel like I don't want to get out on the streets anymore. It kind of makes me even more motivated to come back me too. and even more. You, you, you too? Yeah. Yeah. So, and I've heard a handful of other journalists who have experienced harassment by Scientology say similar things that the more Scientology mm -hmm. would come after them, the more important they realized it was for them to continue exposing the church. Yeah, yeah, totally. Totally. I guess I just have, I mean, I've had existential dread since I was four. <laughs> yep. I don't know what other four year olds, I guess maybe it's an autistic thing. I have no idea. But um, I get to a point sometimes, especially like when I was watching the program, I was crying my eyes out and sure. I couldn't even like form sentences to get my thoughts out to tell Didn't my husband. Because I was just so angry because, like, you have evidence of stuff and then nobody's looking at it. Right. Nothing's getting done. Nobody's going to jail. And you're just like, but. I understand that, too. I mean, it, I, I get what you're saying because it's like, I will say I find them to be productive because it's like, even if you get. Every day in LA before they shut down, which was successful, every day they were convincing 10 people who are about to walk in that door mm -hmm. not to walk into that door. So at the yeah. bare minimum, the bare minimum, all right, let's say percentage wise out of 20 people that walk in the door a day, maybe five of them take a second course. Maybe one of them actually becomes a full-blown Scientologist and gets in too deep. Well, I think the protesters have at least saved 20 people from becoming full-time, full-blown Scientologists. So if, you know, mm -hmm. and that, and then increasing the press, 
you know, increasing attention. Hey, my firing got an article in the New York Post. So that was uh, nationwide attention that people were able to learn how Scientology operated. At the same time, it's like we keep doing this, but David Miscavige is not in jail. Uh, uh, tax Scientology till, still has a tax exempt status. They're still allowed to legally operate. They still have enough money to buy these buildings and renovate them and leave them chilling for 10 years or whatever. And it is disheartening in that. But the question is, ultimately, will the Church of Scientology dwindle to a rich man of one? Meaning, will everybody but David Miscavige will literally be David Miscavige? And he might still have his money and he might be out of jail still. But ultimately, it's going to get so much negative press. My hope is that he he's like a Howard Hughes character in a raving lunatic. Uh, but unfortunately, he might even mm -hmm. die with his millions. That's, that would be my theory. Have you seen the underground bunkers that they have? Well, the I mean, they're Tony's thing, but the literal, I guess they're literal underground bunkers, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah there was one that Aaron <laughs> went through the other day that's like in Northern California in the middle of nowhere. You would see like, right, that's like Australia, apparently. sort of like a circle building and then... Right. They say that like you go in it and then you're just going down and like the whole building is yeah, like cool. underground. That's fascinating. It is pretty cool. It is. Lie about that. that is kind of cool. Yeah. But like, I guess someone brought it up because they were like, yeah, what if Shelly Miscavige is being held there? But they don't think, right. I don't think Aaron thinks that Shelly is there, but he's not really sure what this building is being used for because it's a fairly newly constructed one because, um, there were like Google images of when it was under construction and then now it's completed, or at least it might be com close to completed. Um, right. You would have to go look at one of the Aaron's video about that. But yeah, I always wonder like, what are they doing with these underground buildings? What do they do with all these buildings that yeah, they right. have in secret John, places? And, uh, yeah. Like, I wonder if they have an arsenal of like weapons, like Jonestown massacre. Right. Like, I just want, I'm curious. I want to know things like where, what, <laughs> where is Shelly and what are these things? <laughs> With the internet, it's a lot easier. So who knows if these cults can survive the internet five years from now? They're already dwindling. They're already diminishing. Uh, yeah, but we know. have like 10,000 cults in America. Well, that's true. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, I don't think you can get rid of cults entirely. No. Um but I mean, but you can diminish them with truth. Yeah. And awareness. And you can support. hit them in the, the pocket, you know, money pocket. Um, yes. Waco was a disaster. Sure. Honestly. Free internet, right. right. It was definitely a disaster. I don't know if you saw the, the documentary that Netflix put out of like, yeah, I saw that. It was interesting. All of the, yeah, they had, uh, footage that they had never shown before. Did you hear about that, Jacob? I didn't. What yeah, was the got, documentary called? Do you know? I don't do remember, remember what the document. Maybe it's just called Waco. I'm sure I can find it. Yeah, yeah okay. I think you can find it. It was came out a few months ago or last last year sometime, and they basically interview everybody that was um, on the ground that was in charge of this operation, and it turned out that um, they were hidden, but not hidden well enough. And someone yeah. in Waco saw them and tipped Waco off. But when the, I guess one of the FBI agents was like, well, if they know we're coming, we can't do this now. And then the head of the ATF or whatever was like, nope, we're doing it. We're going in. Yes. And then it just yeah. like, uh, that. watching that was, it really showed you how much of a disaster the FBI can fuck some shit up because a lot of yeah. it and people died. Gosh. Yeah, right. Like it did not have to go the way that it did, but I mean, the thing is, those people were scared of mm -hmm. the of this exact thing happening to them because that's what David Koresh would constantly like preach to them. Right. right. And so they thought that this was their war and they had nothing else to lose. Gosh. And uh, it just like and I've heard about like what was the one that drank all the Kool-Aid? Jim Jones. Jim Jones. Jim Jones. Okay. Yeah. Some Jones people sounds. actually got out of there. Like 
they were being right. hunted so, down, yeah. but some people actually right. made it out alive. Yes. But if you, yeah. um, when they realized what was going to go down and they were like, wait a minute, no. Um, so we've seen some cults go down, but yes. I don't think we could realistically ever get rid of every cult, especially if you still have religion and I don't see religion ever going away. No, mm -mm, no. Well, we get <laughs> the Western world gets less and less religious by the decade, uh, so it probably will go away. Sure. But probably, it's probably take a century for that to happen. Last point: I was yeah. recently looking up um, the statistics on religions, and yep. it seems there like go, it seems like Islam is rising. That's See? the tragedy: is in the Western world, nobody gives a hoot about religion. And then the the, uh, the Eastern world gets so extreme about it, it's getting more and more radical where Islam is. Yeah, like from more the, the re more that. recent stats that I saw, it seems like Islam is the more fastest rising religion yes. right now. Well, because they forced to, because the yeah. Taliban says when you're a baby, hey, be Islam or I'll kill you. Yeah. And then, and then they'll say, hey, if you're Islam and you follow the Taliban, I need you to have 20 children. Yeah, no shit is the fastest growing religion. It's not because it's a better one. Or, or it treats people better. Uh, it's because there's a demand, like in Hasid, like with Hasidic Jews, uh, to mm -hmm. propagate and and spread the cult and brainwash your children as much as you can. Yeah. Well, this is the last. Uh, it's not really a question. Oh, it's yeah. a comment. There's going to be a protest well, in downtown LA. <laughs> this right. is a big anti-LGBTQ protest with very bad actors expected. So I I put this I pinned this one because um wow. one Eric Levey he's another he's another LA based journalist who's done some mm. great work to expose Scientology, but I was thinking when I saw when I saw those comments and I saw a few people echoing that I think it was while we were talking about the Proud Boys that that came that that comment came in, I was thinking well if I get more details about that I might be interested in showing up and counter protesting or maybe trying to oh, interview wow. some yeah. of the folks who are there to. See what I can uh, see what I can get them to say on camera about why they're there. So yeah, good. we'll see. Potentially more to come on that. This well, brings me. Up. Well, let me know, and, and if you do a live stream, uh, give your fans you know twelve hours notice or something, and I'll be <laughs> for sure, for sure. Heck yeah. So about this this comment here, um, this is what I'm thinking. I know that we're all like individuals doing our thing now, but what if? we could literally get it more as a movement and get more and more people in each city across the globe and have like really big protests, like the women's protests. Yeah. Like I That's went to the big idea. one in That's actually a great idea, like, like a one day, one day everybody does it protest. Because mm -hmm. someone said that, LA, yeah, in this they said that Anonymous did that one one time. That would be good. And there's we know there's a handful of Scientology holidays that are out there. And if we become aware that there is, in fact, they're probably going to do LRH's birthday event at a handful of orgs this weekend, I think. Although right. that's this weekend, yeah, it's, a little, hoping, it's a little bit late to plan a worldwide event. But yeah, I, was I would be that totally. They would do something on his actual birthday, but not much was happening on his actual yeah. birthday. Yeah, I think that... Uh, I think that there's a couple of things going on there. One, from what I've heard, is that Miscavige uh, did not book the book the venue in time, so he's do, he's taping the event later than he usually does, which is why they'll be showing the event later than usual. I, so I think that might be part of it. It also wouldn't surprise me if they just don't want to heavily advertise their events the way that they used to because they know that protesters are going to show up. Right. So it right. could be a combination of those. Well, right. wow, we well, this had was a, a great... really long conversation. This yeah. is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you guys Twelve hours. Uh, I, got I, was so right. yeah. I was so nervous. I was so nervous. You were so but... awesome. You're oh yeah, this is great. Well, it's going well. Well, because I also yeah. have like motor tics, and I'm still like get embarrassed by them. Like I feel when I, yeah. <laughs> Well, this is a good community. Yeah. I think that yeah. folks in the chat appreciate. I mean, all normally, of us, I appreciate both of you. Normally, I tell people uh, ahead of time, hey, if I make weird faces or noises, I'm okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, people are like, what's going on? Are you all right? Why are you? Sorry, I'm Mr. Spastic. I like have my muscle spasms <laughs> around all the time. So, you know, I've got ticks too. I that. shake my pencil there all the go. time. There were some times that you might have seen the pencil starting to show up in the frame. <laughs> yeah, I did. This, is, this is me all the time. <laughs> 
Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much to both of you. If you are watching on live, conversation. Oh yeah. I, I love this. We we have this is a lot of fun. We have three good brains here. Amen. Totally, totally. And, and I hope to meet you guys in person, Jacob. I'm going to meet you in person, and then Mandy in between the trial uh, because it sucks paying for places. My uncle, I might go up to Seattle. My uncle has an empty place in Capitol Hill. So hopefully I'll get I'm, to meet you as well in Seattle. Yep, I'm in Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, don't want to say what neighborhood, but yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, now Seattle knows where I'm going to be staying. Great. Cool. Hey. I'm well. No, I'm sure that if like anybody heard me talk about the 2020 protests, they probably can guess where I live. <laughs> Uh, and folks, if you're watching you on my channel, me. make sure that you subscribe to Mandy McGee and Dodge Landisman. Thank you. And thank you to both of you for joining me. Thank you to everybody Yay. who is in the chat for uh, joining joining yeah, to I'll watch us that. live. And thank yeah. you to everybody on the replay crew who's checking this out after the fact. For and, sure. And Mandy and Jacob, please tell my audience again uh, your YouTubes. Yeah, Jacob Harkey. You can find me. That's my name, J-A-C-O-B-H-A-R-K-E-Y. I guess it is on the stream right under my face right now. And then uh, Mandy McGee, exactly. your mix Mandy McGee on uh, yeah. on YouTube, right? Yeah. So that's MX. MX. Well, yeah. If anybody nothing. doesn't know, MX is the gender neutral, like, Mr. or Mrs. Some awesome. people don't know that. So I recently started trying to teach people about what MX is and what right. it means. So, yeah. That's awesome. me. Or you can find me at Great Catsby underscore on Twitch as well. I play games. <laughs> awesome. Mostly <Nice>. Sims. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's where I go from for having cozy corner time, like when I don't want to do deal with like horrible abuse course, situations. Yeah. 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 So Sims is my Sims or music. <laughs> That's those are my two things. Nice. All right. Well, thanks again. I will go ahead and end the stream. Thanks again to everybody for joining, and we nice. will uh, be chatting again soon, I'm sure. Yeah. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye, guys.